Day 102 of Heart Dive 365. I'm your Bible study friend, Kanoi. Welcome to the Heart Dive Podcast. Well, yesterday we got to meet Jonathan. Today we are meeting up with David. And that gets me excited every time because, of course, that gets us one step closer to Jesus. So we are in 1 Samuel chapters 15 through 17 today, reading from the ESV by Crossway Translation. And happy Aloha Friday. Welcome to Bible study. If you're with us in real time, if you are joining us for the first time, we're so happy that you are here. Please let us know in the comments where you're watching from and how you found this Bible study. But if you're part of the Heart Dive family, as always, if you could please help us out by hitting that little like button, letting us know you are here, you're part of the family, and you are excited to get into God's Word. We would love it if you could subscribe to the channel. Also, make sure you got that notification bell on. And if you want to join us in our connect groups, our small groups, our online meeting spaces, make sure to head on over to our Facebook group, and that is where we have all of those scheduled out. You can also join us in conversation there. And if you have any questions about this ministry or this Bible study, make sure to check out the description box or our website, heartdive.org. Otherwise, we're going to go ahead and pray and jump on in. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. You are holy. You are awesome. You are almighty. You are our champion. Thank you, God, for being here with us today in this space and time. I pray that you will be glorified in all things, in our thoughts, in the way that we read today and hear your voice. I pray that you will be glorified, God, in our actions once we leave this space. I pray that this will not be a one-time drop in the bucket, Lord, but this will be something that is written on our hearts so that when we walk out there today into the world, we are able to apply this word, God. I pray your Holy Spirit will continue to guide us, that will bring to mind any scripture that we have been reading thus far. Lord, as we draw near to you, we know that you also draw near to us. So we just thank you for that. We glorify you for it. We give you all of the praise and all of the honor for you are worthy of it. Forgive us of our sins, Lord. I pray that you will please wash us clean today, purify our hearts, open up our eyes and our ears and our hearts to be able to receive your word from you today. And we just ask, Lord, that you will do a work within us like nobody else can. There's nothing that this world can offer that you can, Lord. We love you so much and thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're starting off here in chapter 15. And Samuel said to Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people of Israel. Now, therefore, listen to the words of the Lord. So the Lord is, of course, so merciful, giving Saul chance after chance to get things right here. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came up out of Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction. And your translation might read utter destruction, or maybe even it says devote or set apart. All that they have, do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. So in other words, this means to be put under a ban. That is the literal translation of utter destruction. And that means take nothing, destroy everything. Does this sound harsh and severe? Yes, and it absolutely is. So what is happening here is if you remember when Israel was just coming out of Egypt, they were the first ones to actually strike Israel whenever they were vulnerable. And so because they were the first to attack, God is not going to allow in his holiness any of that sin to persist and to go unpunished. Now, oftentimes when we read about the Amalekites or Amalek, this is symbolic of our flesh and the sin nature and the way that it will too exploit our weakness. So we've got to keep in mind the fact that they were so perverted that this actually is an act of mercy. And I know some people cannot accept that. God knows their future. He already knows what they're going to be exposed to and the kind of decisions that they're going to make. So whenever God would tell his people to utterly destroy, in a sense, if you think about it this way, what he was asking them to do was bring them up to me. And if you can think of it that way, less of like a slaughter and more of this is God's instrument to bring the people to him in judgment, because remember, it's been 400 years that he has allowed them to repent and they haven't done so. And time will never erase sin. There's only one thing that can erase sin for us in this time. Anybody know what that is? What can wash away my sin? Anybody going to complete those lyrics in the comments below? If you don't know the answer, check the comments. I know somebody knows that song. Verse four, so Saul summoned the people and numbered them in Telaim, 200,000 men on foot and 10,000 men of Judah. So notice that we are now dividing up Israel and Judah here. This may have been written after the division 
or this is just a foreshadowing of what is to come. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. Then Saul said to the Kenites, and the Kenites, by the way, were a nomadic offshoot of the Midianites. And so they're not included in this Amalekite judgment here. And if you remember, Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, was actually a Kenite. So, his wife was a Kenite. So, he says to them, go, depart, go down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the people of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So, the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites, and Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive, uh uh-oh, and devoted to destruction all the people with the edge of the sword. So this was a direct violation of God's command here to take Agag. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fattened calves and the lambs. Uh Uh-oh, this is even a bigger uh uh-oh. And all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. All that was despised and worthless, they devoted to destruction. Now, what's interesting here is Agag's name actually means I will overcome. So, in normal war, taking the spoil was kind of seen as payment for those who had fought for the Lord. So, that was considered normal to do that. But in the more severe judgment calls, the Lord would actually call for that utter destruction, which means spare nothing. So, in sparing Agag and the best of the best things for themselves, they are now selectively obeying God. But selective obedience is complete disobedience. And we can look at Agag gag and the spoil as the deepest part of our sin. You know, the root of sin, that's always the hardest thing to get rid of or to let go of. So, these are things that have been so normal for so long that we think, well, surely God understands that I need this. I mean, in a sense, it controls us, and it is usually rooted in some sort of self-gratification. But we have to understand that a holy God will not tolerate living in a house of sin. So, if He dwells within us, He is telling us to utterly destroy everything at its roots. So, heart check. Are you sparing an agag in your life, or are you keeping some spoil for yourself? Verse 10, And the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. Now, there are some people who will get really tripped up on this part because we are going to see later on where Samuel says, God does not regret anything. He is not a man. Well, we have to understand what this Hebrew word of regret actually means. Your translation might actually read repent. And there's been a lot of debate as to the meaning of the Hebrew word. But the way that we understand it here is that when God is saying, I regret, This is more so expressing grief and sadness. It is showing through an anthropomorphism by taking on that human emotion that he understands the way that we feel. He feels the same feelings as us. He's not up there with his little clipboard saying, check, they sinned, done with them, put them in the chute, check, that one is good. He can go over here with the golden eggs, you know? I mean, he's up there with so much compassion, so much love. If if we feel the things that we feel, imagine how and how much of a greater scale he feels those things. So, this was grieving his heart, and that's why he is saying, I regret making Saul king. So, it's not like he's changing his mind because he doesn't do that. And Samuel was angry, and he cried to the Lord all night. And so, this is showing how godly of a man Samuel is because the things that broke the heart of God broke his heart as well. And that will be the case whenever we are spiritually mature and close to the Father. Verse 12, and Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning. And it was told Samuel, Saul came to Carmel and behold, he set up a monument for himself and turned and passed on and went to Gilgal. So no shame here, right? I mean, Saul is setting up this monument to commemorate the victory. So obviously having no guilt whatsoever that he has not obeyed God in the way he was supposed to. So he's definitely not hiding in the baggage anymore, right? I mean, he is proud of this victory. Verse 13, and Samuel, came to Saul and Saul said to him, blessed be you to the Lord. I have performed the commandment of 
the Lord. Okay, no, you haven't. And that's what pride will do. Anytime we become full of pride, we will be deceived as to the truth. And Samuel said, when then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen that I hear? And remember, he is known as a seer to Saul, so he can see things. Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites. Notice he's blaming the people here. For the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God. So here we are seeing that even though he has a relationship with God, he is not calling him our God or his God. He's calling him Samuel's God. And the rest we have devoted to destruction. So notice that he will take credit whenever it is something that he was supposed to do. But when it was something he wasn't supposed to do, he's gonna be like, they did it. I didn't have anything to do with that. But as their leader, he should have been the one to say, hey, guys, that's not right. Y'all shouldn't be doing that. So basically, he's just making up a bunch of lies and excuses here, trying to justify his sin. Then Samuel said to Saul, stop, I will tell you what the Lord said to me this night. And he said to him, speak. And I just thought to myself, man, who does he think he is? Like he's got to give Samuel permission to speak. And maybe he wasn't. Maybe he was just agreeing. Yes, please go ahead and tell me what you have heard. Verse 17, and Samuel said, though you are little in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? So there Samuel is telling him, you had the authority, you had responsibility over them. And the Lord anointed you king over Israel. And the Lord sent you on a mission and said, go divide vote to destruction, the sinners, the Amalekites and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you pounce on the spoil and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me. I have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and I have devoted the Amalekites to destruction. But the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the best of the things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. So he's trying to make this as if it is some spiritual reason as to why they kept the spoil, still trying to affirm his innocence here. And Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. So he's like, all these little spiritual reasons you're making up here, none of that matters in light of your disobedience. So basically, these are empty religious practices. And to listen, then the fat of rams. Now we know that the fat of rams is the most valuable part to the Lord. So he's saying it would have been better for you to listen than to offer him the best of the best. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, which we know that's an abomination in the eyes of God. And presumption is is as iniquity and idolatry. And this, in a sense, was considered idolatry because he put his will above God's will. So this was conscious disobedience, which is a form of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Verse 24, Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words. Now, instead of a comma right here, this really should have been a period. He should have just stopped right there, just simply confessed, simply repented. But look what he does. Because, now he's justifying once again, I feared the people and obeyed their voice. So now he's trying to say, I was worried about what they were going to think. Now, therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may bow before the Lord. And Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. So no turning back, Saul. As Samuel turned to go away, Saul seized the skirt of his robe and it tore. So he's now desperately trying to hold on. And Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day and has given it to the neighbor of yours who is better than you. Of course, this neighbor being David and also the glory of Israel will not lie or have regret for he is not a man that he should have regret. So there we see that direct challenge to what was spoken earlier. Now this regret here, we can look as if God will not lie or relent, meaning he's not going to repent turn around. He's not going to change his position here. So this decision is irrevocable at this point. Now, this glory of Israel might be written strength of Israel. This is the only time in the Bible that we actually see God's name written this way. 
Verse 30, then he said, I have sinned, yet honor me now. So it's like he just can't let it go. You know, he's got to come back up out of the trenches before the elders of my people and before Israel and return with me that I may bow before the Lord your God. So Samuel turned back after Saul and Saul bowed before the Lord. Then Samuel said, bring here to me the Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came to him cheerfully. So he's probably thinking that time did remove what has happened. And Agag said, surely the bitterness of death is past. And so he probably thinks that he's going to be promoted somehow, maybe put into some special position. And Samuel said, as your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless among women. And Samuel hacked Agag to pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. Now we can just look at this as he simply executed him. But obviously this was a very gruesome event here. Verse 34, then Samuel went to Ramah and Saul went up to his house in Gibeah of Saul. And Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death. But Samuel grieved over Saul. And why? Well, this is, again, the mark of a godly spiritual man. No prophet who is truly godly is going to enjoy bringing judgment upon anyone or a word of judgment. So again, this hurt his heart because it hurt the heart of God. And the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. Chapter 16, And the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? So it seems as though Samuel's probably in some sort of mourning. And, and, you know, in the Bible, there's lots of mourning. And there's definitely a reason for it because it is necessary for healing. But there's also generally a set time for the mourning process before the Lord is like, okay, enough crying, time to get back to work, which is what he's doing here. And again, this is with good reason because we do not serve a static God. You know, he is on the move. And if we stay stuck in our grief or our regrets or our disappointments, we're going to completely miss the boat whenever he passes by. Because while he does weep with us, he also wipes away our tears and tells us to arise. And if we follow after him, he will fill our vessel with the oil of gladness. So heart check, are you stuck in something? Have you emptied your vessel for the Lord to pour his oil into so that you can move on? So here he says it, fill your horn with oil. So this horn would have been a ram's horn, which was often used as an oil vessel. And go, I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. So remember, he's the one who is now appointing the king of his choice. And Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. Now, this is a genuine fear here, because if he does hear of this, it's going to seem like treason to Saul. And obviously, Samuel knows him very well in how he reacts to things. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Now, this is not a lie that the Lord is trying to set Samuel up in. What he's doing is saying, you're going to make a sacrifice. And this is the opportunity that I am giving to you for you to be able to get in the door. So the sacrifice would have been necessary anyway. So it's almost like he's reminding Samuel, hey, you know what? Remember, you're going to be doing that sacrifice. Well, if they ask, make sure to tell them this is the reason you are there. And invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do. Now, Jesse is Ruth and Boaz's son, the one, uh, his name is Obed. And you shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. So because the people's choice of king has failed, God is now raising up his king. Samuel did what the Lord had commanded and came to him in Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, do you come peaceably? Meaning, do you come as in the way things ought to be? You're not here trying to threaten us in any way, are you? And why are they suspicious? Well, because this was an unexpected appearance. And he said, peaceably, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves, meaning wash yourselves and cleanse yourselves. This is that ritual cleaning and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. Now, when they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, now Eliab's name means my God is father. Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Well, probably because he's tall, dark and handsome, kind of how Saul was. He is the firstborn, so it would make sense. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks 
on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. So he is really pushing this new perspective here because remember, they were judging Saul by his outward appearance, like, oh, he's going to be the best king ever. And while he did great militarily, he failed in so many other areas. And so God is saying, heart is greater than looks. Now, as humans, you know, we are so quick also to judge a person based on their appearance. And we aren't just talking about a person's hair or their clothing, but even their actions. And we will make assumptions based on our own prejudices or experiences. But we must remember that there's a whole lot that we cannot see that God can. And this is oftentimes why we can't understand why God is doing what He's doing with the people He's doing it with. Because a lot of the time, we can't see the hearts and the motives of people, but He can. It's also why it is not our place to judge others, especially based on what they look like or what kind of clothes they wear, what kind of job they have, or even how talented they are. So heart check, what do you value more, the inward or the outward appearance? And how do you view others? Verse 8, then Jesse called Ahinadab and made him pass before Samuel. So Ahinadab is the next in line. His name means my father is noble. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord hasn't chosen these. So at this point, he must be like, what is going on here? Then Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? And he said, well, there remains yet the youngest. And so we can see how he regards his youngest son. You know, that one is out in the field. He hasn't even invited him to this festival or this feast. And he doesn't even call him by name. He calls him the youngest one. But behold, he's keeping the sheep. Now, shepherds were not the most glorious position in this time. So it's almost like he's just a lowly kid. You don't want him. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and get him for we will not sit down until he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now, he was ruddy. Now, this word ruddy is related to the word red. So it could mean he was reddish. Some people say he was kind of fair in complexion. Others say, oh, no, this means that he was handsome. And he had beautiful eyes, meaning he had a vitality about him and an intelligence. And he was handsome. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him. So this is the first of three anointings that we will see on David in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. So the real anointing happened when the spirit of the Lord came upon him. But this anointing isn't going to be recognized by the mass public until many years later. And this can happen. Someone can be anointed at a very young age, but it isn't going to be until way later that the rest of the world is going to see that anointing. And I thought about this the other day when one of my friends from an old church from many years ago said, I always knew you were anointed. Now look at you. And so I completely understood that when I read that today, like, okay, yeah, I get it. You know, I may have been anointed at a young age, but God kept me hidden for a different time for his purpose. Just side note here, David's name actually means beloved. Verse 14, now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. So back in the Old Testament, you know, the Holy Spirit wasn't living within the people the way he does in us today. He was selective and he would come and go. And a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. So did the Lord actually send this harmful spirit he could have, but also sometimes it's a permissive type of thing where he allows that spirit to go. And Saul's servant said to him, behold, now a harmful spirit from God is tormenting you. Now, this is not something we have to worry about because one, demons cannot touch us unless you invite them in. But two, we have that promise of the Holy Spirit with us and never leaving us unless we walk away from him. That's the only way that he will not be with you. Let our Lord now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is skillful in playing the lyre. And when the harmful spirit from God is upon you, he will play it and you will be well. So Saul said to his servants, provide for me a man who can play well and bring him to me. One of the young men answered, behold, I have seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite who is skillful in playing. 
And we're going to stop here for a second because while we just came off talking about the importance of the heart, there are still other aspects that are considered whenever we are looking at someone who leads with excellence. So David was really good at whatever it was that he did. Everything he kind of touched turned to gold. And Colossians 3.23 says that whatever we do, we are to work at it with all our heart. So David didn't just wake up and then one day he could suddenly play the guitar. You know, he worked on his craft and being skilled at something, it will reflect a hardworking and diligent character. So some people will look at somebody who is really amazing and they will get bent out of shape thinking, oh, they're just favored. You know, they've got God on their side. And meanwhile, they're just sitting back and not doing anything to try to get better at anything. And so we're going to do a heart check right here. What are you doing to sharpen your skills each day? So he is skillful in playing. He is a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a man of good presence. And the Lord is with him. And I was like, man, David has a pretty impressive resume here. You know, it says that he's skillful. He is hardworking. He's got good leadership skills. He is confident. He's articulate. He's trustworthy. And he's also charismatic. And he's well-kept. He looks good. So heart check. What does your spiritual resume say about you? Verse 19, therefore Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, send me David, your son, who is with the sheep. So notice that David went back to the sheep. He was like, well, if I ain't got any work to do here, I'm just gonna go back to work. And Jesse took a donkey laden with bread and a skin of wine. So bread and wine, thinking of communion and a young goat and sent them by David, his son to Saul. And David came to Saul and entered his service. And I love how he had to go call for David from among the sheep, because this means that David wasn't anxiously trying to manipulate or work his way into position. You know, he knew that he had that anointing on his life and a promise, and yet he kept his head down until the Lord opened the door for him. And sometimes a lot of our anxiety stems from trying to make something happen. And because we're doing that, we will get so confused as to whether it is God or not whenever an opportunity does arise or a door opens. I mean, I know that anytime I've ever tried to force the hand of God, even if it was His will or His promise, and I was just simply trying to push Him along and go a little faster than I thought He was doing, it never turned out the way I anticipated it to, because His way and His timing is always best. So heart check. Are you anxiously trying to force God's will? Or are you keeping your head down, meaning just continuing to work and sharpen your skills, and waiting until He opens a door of opportunity? So Saul loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. That is one of the best positions, remember? And Saul sent to Jesse saying, "'Let David remain in my service, for he has found favor in my sight.'" And whenever the harmful spirit from God was upon Saul, David took the lyre and played it with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the harmful spirit departed from him. So David, in a sense, was one of the best worship leaders. I mean, we already saw what his resume looked like, which, by the way, is a really good resume that all worship leaders really should have. But look at what worship did. Look at what praise will do. It will refresh our spirit. So anytime you are down in the dumps, I encourage you to worship. Even if you don't feel like it, just worship through the pain. Worship through the hard times. And it drives away harmful spirits. It can drive away depression. It can drive away anything else that is trying to hold you captive in your mind. Chapter 17, here we come to one of our favorite stories in the Bible, David and Goliath, probably one of the most well-known. Now, the Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and they were gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Soko and Azekah. So Azekah was strategically up on a hill, so it was like overlooking the road in Ephes Damim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in line of battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with a valley between them. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. So this means he was somewhere between eight foot five and nine foot nine. Now this word champion here means a go-between. So this was seen as someone who could stand in for an entire army and fight on his own. 
He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. So this was 125 pounds of chain mail. Now, I have dressed in this kind of stuff before, and I tell you what, it is hot, it's hard to move, it is not easy. And he had bronze armor on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. So his spear alone, just the head of it, was like between 17 and 25 pounds. And he stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And when Saul and all of Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now, at this point, it seems as though they have forgotten all of the victories that they have had through the Lord, as this baffling buffoon just continues on. Now, David was the son of an Ephrathite of Bethlehem and Judah, named Jesse, who had eight sons. Now, in the days of Saul, the man was already old and advanced in years, and the three oldest sons of Jesse had followed Saul to the battle. And the names of his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab the firstborn, and next to him Abinadab, and the third Shammah. David was the youngest. The three eldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. So here we see the amazing character of David. He's not only doing his job to follow after Saul and make sure he's okay, but he's also feeding the sheep, which is what any good shepherd will do. And of course, we are also called to feed the flock, to feed the sheep, right, of Jesus. And for 40 days, the Philistine came forward and took his stand morning and evening. So remember the number 40 is often seen in the Bible during times of testing and trial. And Jesse said to David, his son, take for your brothers an ephah of this parched grain and these 10 loaves and carry them quickly to the camp to your brothers. So bring them some bread and take these 10 cheeses to the commander of their thousand. See if your brothers are well and bring some token from them. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. And David rose early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper. So again, he cares about his flock. He doesn't just abandon them. He leaves them with someone to watch over them. And he took the provisions and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the encampment as the host was going out to the battle line, shouting the war cry. And Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle, army against army. And David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage and ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers. Now, as he talked with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same buffoonish words as before. And David heard him. Now, all the men of Israel Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were very much afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he's come up to defy Israel. And the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him from his daughter and make his father's house free in all of Israel. So now Saul is basically bribing anybody, somebody, because really Saul, if anybody should have been the one to fight Goliath at this point, because remember he was heads and shoulders above everybody else, but he's not. He's trying to find somebody else to do the dirty work. And he is promising now to give riches. This person will no longer have to pay taxes or do any duty of public service. And not only that, they're getting a wife, his daughter and freedom. And David said to the men who stood by him, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Meaning this Gentile, this was an expression of contempt at this point, that he should defy the armies of the living God. So notice that David is more concerned about God and his reputation than anything. And the people answered him in the same way. So shall it be done to the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men and Eliab, Eliab's anger was kindled against David. Why? Because one, he's probably worried that David is going to get some recognition here. Also, he thought David probably had no right to speak up being the youngest. But watch what else he says. He says, why have you come down? 
And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? So he thinks that he just abandoned them. I know your presumption. So he's accusing him here of being presumptuous and the evil of your heart. So he thinks he has bad motives for you have come down to see the battle. So he thinks that David's coming down to try to provoke somebody else to go and fight just so he can watch like he's watching a chicken fight or something. And David said, what have I done now? Was it not but a word? So here, David protesting his innocence of that pride that he's being accused of. And he turned away from him, that is wise, toward another and spoke in the same way. And the people answered him again as before. So he's like, petty delete button, hashtag next, moving on, which is what we all should do whenever somebody is offending us in the most petty way. When they're accusing you of something you know that you did not do and you are innocent of, it's like, turn away, moving on. Verse 31, when the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with the Philistine. And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, and he has been a man of war from his youth. So basically, he has been fighting since before you were born. So this is kind of like the tail of the tape, you know, like he is much older, much more prepared, much stronger. But David knew God's tail of the tape. He said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and I struck him and I killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears and this uncircumcised Philistine is just going to be like one of them. Them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord, who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Now, if anyone were to ask David what kind of training he had, he could simply say, life. Life has been my training. I mean, God had been preparing him for his whole life for this very moment. Every single fight he went through, every single obstacle he faced was simply training for the greatest fight of his life. And if we can change our perspective on the challenges that we face and see them as training camps for whatever it is that is ahead, that would probably alleviate a lot of our turmoil as we go through it. So heart check. Can you see how God has been preparing you for a greater purpose? What fights have you had to fight? Then Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped his sword over his armor. And he tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. This is really cute. You know, I just imagine David in this really oversized armor and trying to walk and probably tripping over his feet. Then David said to Saul, I can't go with these for I haven't tested them. So David put them off. He's like, "Uh -uh, I'm over this. Then he took his staff in his hand, a staff, you guys, and chose five smooth stones from the brook, smooth stones, and put them in his shepherd's pouch. So he is not fighting as a valiant warrior. He's fighting as a shepherd. His sling was in his hand and he approached the Philistine. Now, this isn't a typical slingshot that we think of, you know, like those little ones that you pull back and a little rock goes flying. Slings back in this day were these pouches that they would put the rocks in and they would do one of those kind of things. I don't know. I think that's how they did it. At least that's in my mind. And this is a pretty amazing because this was one of David's wisest decisions. You know, he wasn't trying to fight with someone else's armor. He knew that he couldn't fill the shoes of somebody else. And whenever we face giants in our lives, we have to be courageous in the gifts that we have in our hand. You know, in the battles that we've already won and the ability to fight from the victory of the one who lives within us. Otherwise, we'll never be effective if we are trying to carry around this extra weight of someone else's chainmail. because the Lord has equipped us for our purpose, and we don't need to try to be a copycat version of what someone else is doing. So heart check, are you trying to put on someone else's armor, or are you using what's in your hand to face the giants? And the Philistine moved forward and came near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistines looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? So Goliath's offended here. He's like, this is not going to be a fair fight. 
And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I, I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. That name being, I come to you with the warrior of all warriors, this defender, my defender, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with a sword and spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hand. So he's not fighting for his own notoriety. He is fighting to show them that God exists, that he is the God of Israel. And this really just brought so much peace to my heart today as we are looking at the news and looking at an impending attack on Israel. And we just got to keep praying and keep trusting that God is still the God of Israel. He still has his hand upon them and he delivers against all odds. This has all been written. So we don't have to be anxious about it, but we still need to be in prayer because that is our way to fight battles now. Now, when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand on his bag and took out a stone and he slung it and he struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. Doesn't that remind you of his God Dagon that fell at the feet of the ark? So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David. David. And then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword. He drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. Now, when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and Judah rose with a shout and pursued the Philistines as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron, so that the wounded Philistines fell on the way from Shearam as far as Gath and Ekron. And the people of Israel came back from chasing the Philistines and they plundered their camp. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. And as soon as Saul saw David go out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this youth? Now I was like, wait a minute, is Saul forgetting who David is? He's his armor bearer. Now, I don't think that he forgot who David is. He just wants to know who is his daddy because one, either they're going to have to reward the family for David's victory over Goliath. But two, I really think that Saul is worried about who this kid is. He's worried about where he comes from because he could potentially be someone who is going to take his throne from him. And Abner said, as your soul lives, O king, I do not know. And the king said, inquire whose son the boy is. And as soon as David returned from striking down the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, whose son are you, young man? And David answered, I am the son of your servant, Jesse, the Bethlehemite. Now, at some point in our lives, if not several points, we are all Davids who are facing giants. We're the underdogs. But this account is always such a great reminder that God can use anyone who is willing to step up in faith and slay the giants. And it's amazing that when we do, we will go from looking up at it in fear to now suddenly standing over it as it is flat on its face. So if that is you today, take heart. God is with you. Let him guide your sling and you continue to trust in his death blow of the challenge that you are facing. And whenever we look at some of the things that David did and who he was, you can actually see Jesus. So when we look at the fact that David was a representation of the people, so was Jesus with us. David was sent down by his father. They were fighting on ground that belonged to them. So he's having to go and take it back. The enemy tried to intimidate him the same way he did with Jesus. They were both sent by their fathers. David laid down the armor that was given to him the same way that Jesus laid down his power so that he could become fully human. They were both rejected by their brothers. They relied on God and his guidance. The victory was assured even before the battle started. They were both anointed as king. And remember, Jesus being the bread of life, well, David brought the bread to his brothers, but Jesus is the bread. In the end, they got the bride. We are the bride, the church. So our greater than David is with us today, fighting our battles, slaying our giants. 
and taking a look at some of our deep dive questions. How does Saul reflect or deflect personal responsibility when it comes to sin? And how do we do this? In what ways do the cracks in Saul's character quickly turn to crevices? How can we repair our cracks? Does David's anointing challenge or strengthen your expectations in leadership? What makes a good leader today? How does David's faith strengthen your courage to face your fears? And how does David and Goliath reflect spiritual warfare? Can you relate to it? So Heavenly Father, here we are again. You have called us to listen to your words just as you did with Saul. And once again, we say to you, we are your servants and we are listening. So I pray that we do not miss a single word for your words are life to us. If there is any area of our lives where we are sparing agags, and if we are failing to cut things off at the root, Lord, take the shears and do a work in us. If we are blinded or deceived in any way, please open our eyes so that we are not justifying or trying to hide behind excuses as to why we're doing it. We want to be pure and holy before you so that you can dwell within us. We want your spirit to rule over us and not our flesh. I pray that our fear of you will erase the fear of all else. We never want the fear of man or even our own ego to get in the way of honoring you. And we thank you for the blood of Jesus that washes away every single sin, but it still requires obedience on our part. So hold us up with integrity and strengthen us. Give us new roots of righteousness and goodness so that we will bring joy to your heart and not grief. I pray that our hearts will align with yours so that what breaks your heart will also break ours. And what brings you joy will fuel us to live rightly. We know, Lord, that you desire obedience over sacrifice. And this doesn't mean that sacrifice isn't required. We know it is, but it does not supersede obedience. So I pray that we will bless your heart by doing both, obeying you with our whole heart and sacrificing because you are worthy. You made the greatest sacrifice, Jesus, when you laid down your life. The least that we can do is give up our selfishness. Your will be done in our lives here on earth as it is in heaven. And I thank you, Lord, for wiping away every single tear whenever we are in seasons of sadness or mourning. We are grateful for tears because we know they're healing. But I pray that when it is time for us to arise up out of that mourning period, that you will lift our heads so that we can move forward. We don't want to miss a present move of God because we want to be moving with you always. For when we do begin to move our feet, you will refuel us with your oil of gladness and refresh our spirits with joy once again. We are so grateful that you know our hearts better than anyone. So I pray that we will be a people who don't look at the outward appearance, but at the hearts, just as you do. This gives us hope whenever we feel as though we don't necessarily measure up according to the standard of the world. But in your eyes, if we're faithfully serving and diligently working on our skill, you will raise us up when the time is right. So I pray that we never try to force it because your timing is perfect. Help us to keep our head down until those doors open. And we trust that we will know beyond the shadow of a doubt that it is you. So God, may our resumes be ones that are like David. We so desire to be people who are qualified, hardworking, confident, courageous, articulate, charismatic, and well-kept. I pray that we will have humble hearts that are always set on you. But I also pray that we will steward the gift of our bodies and appearance, presenting ourselves as honorable to you and the people that we are interacting with. We don't need to worry about what others think of our appearance, but we should still be respectful enough to care about not distracting them from the environment that we're in. So thank you for this reminder today. And if we ever get into a space where we are downcast or feeling as though we are being tormented, God, I pray that you will remind us of these moments with Saul and David so that we can respond with worship. We know how freeing it is and how it will refresh our spirit, but also drive away the enemy as we bring you glory. Thank you for preparing us today, not only through your word, but also through the battles that we face. We know it is training ground for the day when we will face the giants in our lives. And each time we defeat one giant, it just makes us stronger and more well-prepared to fight an even greater one. So I pray that we will never forget the victories so that we will remember that you are with us at the battlefront. And thank you, Jesus, for being our champion. 
You are fighting on our behalf, taking back what's been stolen and dropping the enemy flat on his face. He can taunt us all day, but we will keep focused on you, knowing that you are the ultimate giant slayer. Please don't allow his buffoonish taunting get the best of us, but I pray that we will instead turn away and continue to declare victory. Thank you, Jesus, for not succumbing to the rejection and taunting of the people. You give us so much hope when we are in the middle of a battle. You know exactly what we're going through. So I pray that you will sharpen our swords and tighten our armor so that we are prepared when we do hear the words, step up. We will not fear, for you are with us. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Heaven and salvation is a divine gift that is given to us by grace. None of us deserve it. In fact, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death, and every single one of us have fallen short, and then we desperately need someone to pay that price. And Jesus did it. He didn't do it because we are righteous on our own merit. He did it because He loves us, and He wants to spend eternity with us. But it won't happen if we don't receive Him before we leave this earth as Lord and Savior. Hell is a very real thing, and there is no second chance after we take our last breath here. So I want to be able to give someone the opportunity today who is saying, I'm ready. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm going to end up after I die, but I don't want to live another day without knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt where I am going to end up. I see now that this is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're going to say a prayer and I'm going to put the words on the screen so that you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that He died and rose again, then you will be saved. So we're going to say this prayer together. Believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came, you died, and you rose again. I confess my sins to you today, and I turn from them, and I now live my life for you. I know that I am forgiven of all my sins, so I receive you now as Lord and Savior, and I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.